for the Initiative of Public Choice and Market Process. The mission of the Initiative of Public Choice and Market Process to advance the understanding of the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. And we support this in a variety of ways through speakers such as today, faculty research, student research, and a variety of um, other activities. I encourage you to look us up on uh, Facebook and to find our webpage on the uh, School of Business um, page. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor Edward J. Lopez from San Jose State University, where he is a professor of law and economics. He earned his bachelor's uh, at Texas A&M University and his PhD in economics from George Mason University. He is currently the president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and the co-editor of the Journal of Economics and Finance Education. His main areas of research are in public choice and law and economics. And Professor Lopez is the author of uh, dozens of scholarly articles in journals and book chapters. His main areas of research are in takings, campaign finance, entrepreneurship, and political institutions. Uh, he's got an article coming out in the December Freeman on fashion and copyright. And today he's going to talk to us about fashion, innovation, and copyright in defense of design copies. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Lopez. <laughs> to wear is an important one. It helps define us as individuals. It helps define the relationships that we have between each other. Over the course of history, there have been lots of laws that have regulated um, people's individual choices of what to wear. We don't have those laws in place um, uh, on the books today, at least not in our society. But we do have informal norms, uh, social conventions that say what's appropriate to wear in, in particular settings and what isn't. So uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, area uh, uh, of human life for economic reasons, for legal reasons, and also for reasons of individuality and liberty, and the, the way that we all relate to each other. Okay? So I can't take um, all of those chunks off in the span of 40 minutes or so. So what I'd like to do is today focus on the uh, copyright implications. Okay? But I will dab a little bit into um, the history of fashion to get the discussion going. Now, uh, today there are six main fashion centers around the world, um, and probably uh, two dozen or, or so uh, secondary fashion centers around the world. But it wasn't always the case. Take New York, for example. It was only in the late 19th century when New York began, began to become uh, you know, a serious center for clothing in particular, um, design clothing for fashion itself. And as this uh, emergence of New York as a fashion center, 
um, was taking place, uh, uh, people in New York were confronted with issues that they turned to the law to, to resolve. Right? So that's the way common law works. Um, a court will hear a set of novel facts, and try to re uh, you know novel circumstances, and try to resolve um, that that conflict, those circumstances, with the body of law that came before it. Okay, so around in the 1920s or so, designs like these that you see on the uh, on the screen uh, were were fairly popular. And uh, this is I found from the New York uh, Public Library. Uh, these plates are, are are pretty interesting in their own rights because you get to see. Um, the types of things that were fashionable in the, 19, in the late 1920s, but also the plates are really interesting because of the manufacturer of these, a company called Cheney Brothers. Now Cheney Brothers was actually a pretty, uh, very successful company around this period of time and going into um, the, uh, the, the next uh, decade as well. And what they did, what they have the reason, or one of the ways that one of the reasons that they were successful was their they would uh, uh, find that not every type of design was going to become uh, popular among buyers, in this case, among women buying uh, dress designs. And so what they would do is their business model was based on the idea that we're going to experiment. We're going to try to come up with not just one or two designs that we think will become popular, but we're going to come up with dozens of designs at once. And we know that many of these, maybe most of these, are not going to become popular, and they're going to be losers for us. But out of this big pool of experiments will emerge the ones that are popular, and we're going to make money off of those. And in essence, we're going to cross-subsidize our losers uh, by the money we make on our winners. And that was their business model. Some of these would make money. Others were not. Would not. But on that, overall, it was a successful business. Now, Cheney Brothers was not the only um, uh, seller of women's clothing in town. And uh, uh, there's nothing tougher than market competition. Right? So another company, Dora Silk, uh, was, a, was a direct competitor. Now, Dora Silk had a different business model. Dora Silk said, why experiment? Why don't we just observe the, the designs and the, and, uh, that are becoming, going to become popular? And why don't we just start selling those? Wait till Cheney figures it out. And that way we don't have to incur the fixed upfront costs of innovating on our own. We just find out what the, what the popular ones are, we copy those, and we put those somewhere. Now put yourself in the shoes of Cheney Brothers. What types of problems are you having as Cheney Brothers in this situation? One major problem is that you are incurring the fixed upfront costs of innovating and experimenting. Therefore, the prices that you charge on your winners have to be sufficiently high to offset the costs that you sink into your losers. Whereas Dora Silk doesn't have to um, um, cross subsidize any of anything because they don't have any losers. So what we saw actually is Dora Silk was undercutting. They weren't just copying. Cheney Brothers. They were undercutting Cheney Brothers in the marketplace. Now put yourself in Cheney Brothers shoes now. You have a real issue on your hands. You might not be, be um, uh, viable as a business model. <coughs> now again, this is New York. Fashion centers emerging in New York. This is America. What do we do in America when we have uh, when, when a situation like this comes up? Well, we do automatic updates in America. That's yeah. one thing. <laughs> Uh, later, how about that? We go to court. And sure enough, Cheney Brothers took Dora Silk's court, and this court rose to the New York uh, court system. It did not go all the way to the United States Supreme Court, but it was heard by a very famous judge, probably the most famous judge who was never a Supreme Court justice, Judge Learned Hand. And so Judge Learned Hand hears the complaint, and he's sitting here and he's thinking, boy, this Dora Silk business model is a real stinker. There's just something that doesn't sit right in the And I imagine that might be something along the lines of what your reaction is. They're just copying and undercutting. Seems something not fair about that. But in hand, in the opinion that he wrote for this case, it jumps off the pages at him that he thinks also it's not fair. On the other hand, he 
couldn't find any refuge in the laws before him to do anything about it. The first thing he said was, look, we don't have any statutory protection for chain brothers. We can't patent dress designs because the patent law says um, anything that's patentable has to be novel and not obvious. So dress designs lack sufficient originality. There's another thing um, that, that, that keeps it from being patentable because the patent process itself is a months long, maybe a year long type of thing. It's a long process. But fashion designs go out of style really quickly. So by the time you would patent it, it wouldn't be worth the patent, it would be worth the same. So no patent protection. Guess what? No copyright protection either. The reason why is because the Copyright Act explicitly excludes things that are, that are known as useful articles, right? So, by all means, dress designs embody uh, fashion ideas. Dresses, uh, fashion designs are, are creative expressions of the designer, but they are also things that we use to cover our bodies with. So, in the fact that we cover our bodies with them, that's the sense in which they are recognized legally as useful articles, and therefore not. So we have no statutory protection. We also have no protection under the common law. Now, the lawyers for Cheney Brothers knew that these first two uh, arguments that were they were up against the law. So they, they barely even paid much attention to them. But what they did say is that there's a leading precedent that involved the Associated Press researching and paying people to write stories about the news, and then you know local papers out there just copy and reprint it. And uh, not essentially the associated press of those markets. Now, for reasons that we don't have time to get into, uh, that precedent was not uh, recognized as uh, binding to these sets of facts. So we have no statutory protection and we have no common law precedent. And when it can, reluctantly, because he's real sympathetic with Kenny Brothers here, reluctantly concludes, sorry, um, a man's property is limited by the channels which embody his invention. Anybody can copy those at their pleasure. But essentially what this means is Kenny Brothers, if they produce a dress, owns a physical property of the dress, but doesn't own the overall appearance of it. You can copy the jacket dress itself, even though it's cut. The alternative is also what if Lord Hand had ruled otherwise. Then he would be overstepping the bounds of the courts. He would be acting like Congress. Because in granting copyright protection, that is setting up a monopoly. The Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 8, says in order to promote the sciences and useful arts, Congress has the authority for limited times to give exclusive rights to authors and inventors. The exclusive right thing is the monopoly. So he says that's not my job, that's Congress's job. <coughs> Essentially, the message of course, to, to Cheney Brothers saying, you came to the wrong place, you should be going to Congress instead of Congress. Now, uh, what, what holds for Cheney Brothers holds for the fashion industry in Brock. Anybody whose business model is essentially consistent with Cheney Brothers' business model is now, um, by this decision, is now vulnerable to having their designs copied and other kind of So it's not just Cheney Brothers, it's the fashion industry as a whole that learned at hand is saying, you ought to be going to college instead. Well, they didn't initially, they, the fashion industry did not initially go to Congress. They initially turned to themselves. And they said, what can we do about it? And so what they decided was, you notice that just a few years after the 1929 court decision, the Fashion Originators Guild of America was initiated in 1932 and it started lasting until 1941. They set up a cartel. The cartel said, let's all of us design originators. Let's all of us build uh, so, uh, chain brothers types of design companies. Let's band together and let's refuse to do business with retailers that carry the merchandise of copyists. <laughs> And we're going we're gonna to send uh, mystery shoppers out. Mystery shoppers who are trained to spot copies. And we're going to have a tribunal to determine if it's a closed case, whether it is a copy or not. And the consequences are, if you're a retailer in New York, if you're doing business with known copyists, you can't do business with us. That was the policy. 
policy of the fashion of the United States of America. Okay, eventually it worked. It worked because there's some evidence that, that, that shows that the higher prices of clothing at the time what, uh, came from guild members. Um, on the other hand, it was, uh, it turned out that it ran afoul of another area of law, not intellectual property law, but antitrust law. The laws on the books that say um, people of the same business can't come together and conspire um, to, uh, to harm the public, conspire to raise prices, etc. Paraphrasing that was there. So the Federal Trade Commission sued um, the Fashion uh, Guild and uh, eventually worked its way through and it did go to the Supreme Court of the United States. And in 1941, the Supreme Court essentially visited the Fashion Guild. So now the industry is in this situation. No statutory, no common law, and they can't enforce it themselves. At least not this way. What has, what has resulted ever since 1941 has been what uh, uh, a very famous article on this topic uh, described as a low IP equilibrium. It's an equilibrium because we've been in it for now for 70 years. It's low IP because fashions typically don't enjoy uh, copyright and protection. There's a, there's a little bit of trademark and other types of uh, intellectual property protection, but for the most part, it's very, very low and very, very limited. Um, and uh, as, a, as a result, with very, very low IP protection, you get the expected result. What's the expected result? Lots of copies. Lots and lots and lots of copies. Some of the copies you, you know about, you've heard about. Now, I love visiting Charleston. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, if you go to Chinatown in San Francisco, you can go to places where you can find interesting handbags. Right? Interesting handbags. Two interesting handbags side by side. Which one's the real one and which one's the fake one? What do you think? So do you guys recognize this? Do you guys recognize the brand? Who knows what the brand is? Burberry, right? That's important that people recognize the brand. Because I'll tell you, this is the original. This is the genuine one. This one's the fake one, right? Now, Burberry does have intellectual property right on the specific design of this Nova jacket pattern, right? The specific width of the stripes, the specific spacing, the, the combination of the colors and so forth. So if you try to make a handbag with that exact uh, pattern on it, you're going to run afoul of trademark. You will be a counterfeit. And so this one is a counterfeit. It's not a counterfeit exactly in the pattern, but it does have the little brass tag that says Burberry. So it's a, it's a direct, overt uh, counterfeit of the genuine. Now this is the type of copy, like a couple more examples. Which one's the real one, which one's the fake one? The real one's on the right, yeah. And actually there are a couple different patterns that Burberry has, uh, trademark, I believe. And this one here is, uh, it's, like, the colors don't show up too, too well as far as I can tell. Maybe I'm going to a little bit. But yeah, the right one is the genuine, the left one is the fake. How about these? Both fakes. It's a trick question. We think investors are full of them, aren't we? They're both fakes. Yeah. So you can go to Chinatown and find these all over the place for 15, 25, 85, 110 dollars, something like that. Why the difference in price? Um, because there, there's a difference in the quality of the products. There's not about A, there's not about B, there's not about C, and so Okay, but this, these copies are fun to look at. But they're not exactly the types of copies that I'm talking about because, as I said, these are violations of trademark law, not quite copyright. So let's so let's uh, let's look at some types of copying that are a little bit more relevant to what we've got to the uh, uh, the motivation today. Okay, so the gown on the left, the dress on the left is an original. The dress on the right is a copy. The designer on the left is Narciso Rodriguez. Then we should probably try to say Narciso Rodriguez is an artisanal. He gets up every morning and works on a mannequin. And he has a nice, it's somewhat struggling for a while, but he has a nice business going. And this uh, this dress was 
I don't know the exact numbers, but think about it. If you get up in the morning and you work with your hands every day, you're not going to be producing mass quantities. But you're going to be producing very, very high quality. So what you, might, what you might think is that he was targeting small quantities of high price, very, very niche one. But um, the, the, the overall appearance is actually fairly obvious. Uh, ob it's obvious that it would be easy to copy. And in fact, it was. This is a, um, a mass uh, uh, market um, company. Uh, it was a subsidiary of the, of the Gap. And it was an experiment uh, by that company trying to target the sort of 40 something uh, uh, female uh, market. And as you can see, um, the overall appearance is copied. What you can't see, though, is that the craftsmanship, the quality of the fabric, uh, the number of seams to give it uh, a more flattering look, and so forth, those are things that are really costly to copy. And if you try to copy those, you're going to be trying to be, compete directly with Marcus Rodriguez, and he's a master if you're not. So what you do is you, you make rough copies, and you reduce the cost, so you can sell lots and lots and lots of versions of it at lower and lower, lower prices, not a tiny niche market, but a little bit more than that. So that's one example. Copying from uh, literal translation from designer to design firm. Another kind of copying is literal translations from designer to designer. Okay, and here's an example, fairly quickly, because we want to get to some more examples. Jeffrey Chow, uh, uh, selling a bit at a fairly high average, $1,000. <laughs> you don't expect to sell a relatively high number of these dresses. Um, but here's another designer, Alan Schwartz, uh, Schwartz is a designer who prides himself on bringing um, <coughs> copies of uh, new designs from the runway to the rack in record time. And also, by a similar process, using a little bit less lower quality fabric, maybe cutting a seam here or there, um, <coughs> uh, and so forth and so on, producing, uh, uh, re reducing uh, average costs by producing mass quantities, Alan uh, Schwartz is able to, to offer the a similar overall look at a quarter of the price. Right. So that's another type of uh, copying that is going on. We also have overall um, copy, look, a copy of overall looks, um, fashionable looks that are coming up from one firm to another firm. Now this is an interesting example because, well, I, I love it because one of my students gave it to me. But she's no longer my student, and, um, I, and she, when I asked her recently, she forgot. I, was, I asked her, what line is that? Do you guys know what line that is? Is it diesel a good guess? Yeah, is, that, is that plausible? Could it be diesel? I see a couple people nodding their heads, so uh, let's, let's pretend it's diesel. Okay? And it's, it's, uh, diesel is a, is a, um, a relatively high-end uh, line. On the right, you have a visibly similar overall look. What do you think the, 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 uh, the line on the right is? I know you can only make out part of that word. It's girl. That word is girl. <coughs> Walmart is the word around Walmart, in fact, started showing at New York's Fashion Week in 2005. So you, would, you can, you can, you can uh, infer from this that this is a relatively expensive package and this is a relatively less expensive package. So you have this kind of copying going on as well. Uh, and then you have uh, a copying of overall looks from a single firm to what I call diffusion, right? Multiple firms copying. And again, overall look, but from a single firm, Oscar de la Renta, to um, multiple firms. I'll show you this later. Right. Uh, this is just a teaser for that. Most infamously, most famously, you have the copying of sort of iconic, famous designs of uh, high and enduring uh, market value. Narciso Rodriguez is famous because he happened to be friends with Carolyn Messet before she married JFK Jr. And she asked him to design her wedding gown. And he did. He designed, as you can see, a beautiful dress. One that oh, oh, which bride wouldn't want to have to And so in 1996, when the, uh, uh, when the marriage happened and the dress design was published, right, through photography, instantly it was copied 
that instantly was made available effectively across the world at prices uh, that Narciso Rodriguez could never compete with. And he actually never was able to get this uh, this design working and, and, and you know fully fully onto the market. So here's I don't know where the location here is, but you can see this is a, an explicit overt reference to um, uh, to her down and he design. And I don't know the price here, but you can um, again imagine something much lower than what Narciso Rodriguez was able to do. Now this is the kind of copying that really gets the high-end designers um, uh, angry, right? Because what they're, what's happening here is he puts he gets up every morning and, and blood, sweat, and tears go into his design, and then automatically it's copied by people who have no who have no uh, uh, who incur no costs in innovating that design. So that's kind of the situation. Oh, and as just as a uh, uh, a footnote to that, okay, that. It's still popular. Fifteen years later, you can still go online and find versions of it with explicit references of "steal this sleeveless uh, chiffon dress, make this style yours." Narciso Rodriguez, 1996, the seventh. So, uh, this is a design of, of uh, enduring uh, value that has become iconic and. Under the law, it's, it's, it's uh, people can lawfully copy it and render versions of it for a cheaper prices. So, in summary, copying, um, to this point in summary, copying has become random. And it's, it's a function of the fact that copying is legal. So, you have copies can be produced you know, uh, basically instantaneously, uh, within a few weeks, if you will, once a design becomes hot. Um, uh, and uh, as, as the, the, the authors, Rossiella and Sprigman, they are the ones who, um, they are the authors of the famous uh, Law Review article that I mentioned a few moments ago. <laughs> as they say, um, yeah, this goes on at every level of the uh, fashion uh, apparel marketplace. And um, one puzzle is, uh, you know, why is it tolerated? One puzzle that they talk about is, why does the industry seem to acquiesce? Why does the industry seem to Tolerate the fact that copying is right. They have a, a, a couple of interesting and, and fascinating, actually, explanations for it. But one, what I'm going to focus on is what's the expected result of copying being right? Well, I decided to stop. And so here's a, a screenshot of a website that had um, a film, uh, a 10 minute film. Um, with interviews of high-end designers and high, um, uh, influential people in the, in the uh, fashion business, editors of fashion magazines and so forth and so on. And what are they saying? They're saying to you, the general public, they're saying uh, high-end fashion designers are, are artists. The, the, the things that they produce are creative expressions. And they're being copied. This is not, we don't tolerate this in other industries. Paintings, music, books, movies, you, the general public, should be outraged that we as a society ought not to tolerate this in fashion either. So stop design uh, piracy. Um, get on board. Call your, call your member of Congress and support the, or, uh, the Design Piracy Pro Prohibition Act. The industry is now. Unlike in, the, in, in 1941, unlike in 1949, the industry is now coming out of this. Um, after Fashion Week in 2008, uh, uh, February 2008, um, several high, of these high end designers went from New York, took the shuttle down to DC, and Fashion Week went to Washington. And what does Narciso Rodriguez do? He testifies before Congress. And what's the, I mean, sorry, I don't. I know I'm picking on Mr. Rodriguez uh, in this talk, but he kind of makes himself easy to pick on because he says things like, restart later. He says things like, they have stolen my DNA. You know? And he says things like, we need your help. You know? And he's telling Congress, he's like, stop these copyists from undercutting me so that I can make copyists. They have me a monopoly. He has a supporting cast. The Council of Fashion Designers of America. 
chaired by Diane von Furstenberg. Tim Dunn was also in Washington that week. If you've seen Project Runway, uh, you know who he is. Also in the supporting cast are lots and lots and lots of IP lawyers who are loving their cases uh, under this expanded version of the So what is the expanded version of the Copyright Law? It's no longer the Design Privacy Prohibition Act. Over the last six years or so, um, the, the original version of this uh, bill was proposed about six years ago. And over that time, it's been sort of humbled uh, to make sure that it's consistent with the statute, the Copyright Act itself. Um, it's been rewritten to uh, you know, sort of settle lots of political compromises between different um, segments of the industry. Lots of things have happened, uh, uh, you know, lots of uh, changes have been made to the proposed legislation, but the core of it has remained intact. The core of it says, uh, and the most recent version was, was proposed uh, uh, two months ago by Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, who is a fashion senator. I think it is notable that Senator Schumer is one of the most powerful senators in, in, in the U.S. Senate. He was not on board, he was not even a co-sponsor on the early version of this bill. And he has become, once uh, the compromises have been made, once all the I's and the dots and the T's were crossed, he uh, becomes the lead sponsor. Basically, the act says, um, <clears throat> protect the appearance as a whole of designs for three years. More or less, period. Okay? Now, what happens if, if there's an instance of copying? If there's an instance of copying, if I originate a design and you copy it, what I have to do is I have to show that yours is a copy, and then I can bring a lawsuit against you, essentially. And if I win, then you have, you have to pay some penalties under the, under the statute, then you can also be found uh, liable uh, for some damages to me. There's, a, there's some other intricate details um, to, the, to, the, um, to, to, to the proposed bill. One of the changes that was made from previous versions was um, designers no longer have to register their designs as long as have them protected. So it's kind of like uh, what you're, the notes that you're writing right now. You are fixing those notes in tangible form on the paper that you're writing. If you simply write at the bottom, copyright your name in 2010, then you're protected. Nobody can take your notes and remove them from your notes. Similar thing with re removing the requirement for registration. If I just publish a dress design, uh, I, I, a model carries it down the runway, it's protected. Now, uh, I still have to meet the burdens of showing that yours is a post up copy for me to bring uh, a case against it. But that's basically the, the, the lay of the land of what's being proposed here. So what I'd like to say is, um, what are we really talking about here? The adjectives that we use to describe this copying process, I think, are important. A lot, oftentimes, in the in the video uh, for that stop uh, design piracy, um, in the uh, comments, pieces of commentary that have been written about this, in the public statements that design originators uh, have issued, copyists are, are vilified. They're treated as really a bad guy. They're called parasites. They're called pirates. You know, a little bit less severe, they're called knockoffs. Um, a little bit more complimentary would be something like referencing. Oh, yes, I know this word. Uh, copying, uh, more sort of neutral, um, generic type of it, but then something even that, that connotes something entirely different from parasitic or, 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 or uh, piratic activity. Imitating. Isn't imitation the highest form of flattery? Right? Or even something more constructive, a more constructive word that you could use would be adaptive. We're improving that. So what I'd like to do is challenge the general public, challenge you to think of copyists not automatically as pirates or parasites, but possibly as something very constructive and very flattering to those who are design originators. What is copying anyway? Well, from the perspective of conventional economics, I'm an economist, copying basically is saying you get to be Doris Silk instead of having to be chain -like. You can produce at marginal cost instead of having to incur the fixed costs of innovation. You can produce at cheaper um, uh, costs. 
And actually, eventually, Goddard says that's the reason why we need intellectual property. That's the reason why we need successful stuff. In music, in books, in film, in those other industries. But is that so in fashion? Let's take a look for a few minutes at the fact that, that, that what fashion markets uh, uh, really are from the, from the point of view of the others. First of all, fashion goes up positional. Positional good means the value that you get out of, that a person gets out of having the good, depends on who else also has the good. Right? Doesn't that sort of just classically reign consistent with fashion? Right? Um, consumers uh, at relatively high ends uh, with, with, very, with, with refined and high end tastes value novelty, continual novelty. Fashion is always good. Because a lot of people value all these things. Variety, also exclusivity, we all have that. And all of this somewhat boils down to status, relative status. These are the consumer preferences that are out there. That's just what, um, what, is, what is the case in this market. As a result of that, though, fashion is cyclical, right? So the upper niche of consumers, if other people are going to be copying what they wear, that, um, that undermines the exclusivity and the status of what they were, they were wearing and go on to something new. So as this trickle down occurs, the novelty is there's, there's, there's continual demand for novelty at the time. As, a, as another consequence of that, we have the, the fashion market is uh, highly segmented. You can go into a store um, and, and you know uh, basically um, if you're, if you're uh, aware of um, a clothing stores, you'll go into a store and you'll notice it's actually one of the price rates. Walk into an old lady, look around, you know where you are, you know what the price range is going to be. Walk into a gap, and you, know, you look around, and you know, you know it looks a little bit similar, but the quality is a little bit better, and there's a little bit more design uh, uh, components to the, to the wares in there, and the price range is going to be better. Walk into a Banana Republic, and you're a little bit higher up from the, uh, from, from the gap. Fashion is cyclical and segmented. And then here's a, the third point is a really important point. Fashion is, uh, is innovative, even though it lacks intellectual property protection under the law. From an economic perspective, the whole point of giving intellectual property uh, rights is that the the, the argument that's made in the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8, it says to promote science and the useful arts, to promote innovation. We want to give short, uh, temporary, exclusive rights to authors and inventors. Right? Now, the language has been broadened considerably through the initial Copyright Act in 1782 uh, to all of its revisions, the latest one being in 1998. To help us not just authors and vendors, but all types of innovators. The whole point of intellectual property law protection would be to support innovation. But guess what? Fashion is innovative without intellectual property protection. You can see that by looking out the window. New designs are coming up all, all, uh, uh, almost constantly. You can see that by the pace of innovation increasing over time. Have you heard of the fast fashion phenomenon? Right? Fast fashion essentially is when we're not going to get out and have this, we're going to bust out of this, we have a spring line, we have a fall line. We're going to bust out of that, we're going to say, we're going to elicit preferences from consumers at the store level, at the retail level, and we're going to respond to those preferences in a matter of weeks. A lot of technology has to go with that. A lot of innovation has to go with that. Right? So fashion is vibrantly innovative. In economics terms, that the innovation of fashion is inelastic in the presence of intellectual property protection in the law. So, with a couple of those, let me, let me sort of give you a, a, a bit of a visual here about the sort of you know, the fashion itself. Um, here's where you know it kind of begins, and it's top down, and uh, designers are originators. They're taking a lot of risks, not of like Chini Brothers, you know, experiments. They're taking lots of risks. Um, the, the margins of competition are on status. You know, which are the designers that have the best um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, reputations uh, in the moment? Um, but as um, as they look or as a design becomes 
uh, as it uh, goes farther into time, because around the water it becomes more mature. The designers are not necessarily are not originators anymore. They're adapter. They're adapting and they're imitating. The whole point is uh, the the the, uh, the business uh, model is not necessarily risk taking. It's confusion. How can we get this out to as many people? Um, there's uh, competition among suppliers on price margins. Um, not only price, because there's also a high, still high design content at this stage. And then once a look or once a uh, fashion becomes uh, even more mature, it becomes saturated. Uh, think of the old baby situation now, low design content, an aging or awareness trend, and most of your competing uh, suppliers are competing on price. Right. So you have this diffusion process, this cycle. So then eventually it becomes obsolete, and that's when I think it is. <laughs> Alright, so here's an example. Have you seen a person wearing a hat like this in the street in Francisco? In San Francisco, do I kind of peer around the, 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 on the bar, you know, to see where I am because somebody in front of me is wearing this hat? Or if you're in the movies, you have to ask someone, can you take off this hat? You don't see this hat. This hat is, it was published by Carolina Herrera on the runway. And Carolina Herrera was, was quoted as saying, the fashion week is about fantasizing. It's abstract. It's not something that most buyers can relate to. It's not something that you would think most people would wear. And I think that it's consistent with this reaction that, that people have a lot of times when they see something coming down the runway and say, who would wear that? Who would wear that? But it's not irrelevant. I think it's not irrelevant. It's not irrelevant because of this. And we can see that it's not irrelevant because it influences what people are wearing a little bit later on. What comes down to the catwalk influences and systematically related to what we see on the side. And here's some evidence. Tweed hats. A couple of feathers in there. Not eight foot long feathers. You know? But the general concept is there. It's not as abstract. It is something that people can relate to more. Right? <clears throat> and also, look at these prices. It's dual, right? So there's something happening here. There's something happening by the fact that these designs can be copied. What's happening is, you go from, <clears throat> say, uh, come back to our original example here, if you were to purchase this look, Oscar de la Renta, here's what you I don't know what you would do with $6,180, but I'd probably want to call it, right? You could do that, or you could go to Banner Republic and get the sweater, not the exact sweater, obviously, but something like it. Something that goes to the same overall look. For 69 bucks, you could go to uh, Forever 21, get the belt and the skirt for 40 bucks. <coughs> And you can go get the boots at guess for one night. Now you go to Cabo um, with uh, 6,180 minus 318. Right? So you have that choice. We as consumers have this choice. And we have that choice because copying is rampant. And copying is rampant because copying is rampant. What is design copying? It is segmenting the market through adaptive imitation which in turn reduces cost. It is increasing access to people, I don't know about you, but people like me, who don't have six grand burning in their wallet to go buy them. Come back to Gentile and Schwartz. People like me, who don't have a grand burning in their, uh, in their wallet to go buy them. Is it mere copying, or is it innovation? That's the question I want to ask. Think of copyists as downstream innovators. They take abstract designs and they make them something that people can relate to. And even if you don't pay attention to fashion, even if you think that people spend too much time thinking about clothing, even if you think that people spend too much money on clothing, you still have something that you can relate to. You still have places that you can go and buy clothes and your socks match with your shirt. And that's not an accident. So my point is that these adaptive imitators um, make the abstract real, 
from the cat onto the sidewalk. They discover cost reducing methods and therefore they make the cash and the market. In terms of entrepreneurship, we need both. We need the originators and we need the economists as well. We need them because that's what the that's how the market is serving society. In some in some in some uh, in some nineteenth century language, I'm knocking off myself here. In some nineteenth century language. Frederick Bastiat, writing in eighteen forty eight, French economist, marvels at the fact that Paris gets fed, even though there's no authority saying this number of loaves of bread, this number of bottles of wine, this number of bottles of cheese. <laughs> Diffuse activity in the marketplace makes sure that Paris gets fed. Well, guess what, Mr. Bastiat? Paris gets clothed as well. And it's because of this adaptive imitation process following on the heels of this origination of the process. High-end consumers get what they want, property, exclusivity, etc. Continual innovation. Low-end consumers like me get what we want. Something that looks decent and matches and doesn't um, interfere with my ability to buy a World Series ticket. Paris gets played. So I'll leave you with a, I apologize, a little bit lengthy quotation of a famous scholar of entrepreneurship, Joseph Schubert, writing in 1942 his classic Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. He says, look, even Queen Elizabeth had uh, owned silk stockings. It's not, it's not a, 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 a great feat. It's not a miraculous thing that Queen Elizabeth had had stockings. The, the, uh, the achievement is to bring silk stockings within the reach of that. So, I'm fascinated with this idea. I'm fascinated with the very different ways that we can look at fashion and, um, as, and, and, and treat copyists and with the possibility that we can start to look at copyists not as villains, as parasites and, and, uh, and pirates, but as maybe something that's constructive, maybe something that's vital, maybe something that we all really depend on uh, in ways that we don't always ever necessarily appreciate. So I appreciate being able to come and talk to you today. I think we have some time for questions if Pete, if, uh, if, if, if I'm right. And uh, I'd love to talk to you some more as a group or in person after. <laughs>
right? Guess what? In 2018, it's coming up again uh, for expiration. I expect Disney to come back to Congress right around then, right? Um, but then there are also lots of uh, court cases. Matt Midler won a case against Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company came to her and said, we want to use you as a voiceover for our, our TV commercials. She said, no way. That's against my policy because it'll make me look too overexposed. Ford Motor says, I can't really want you. She said, no way. So they go, okay, we can't work with you, that's fine. They went and got a voice in the game. It sounded exactly like her. She sued and she won. The reason why she won is the same reason why you guys recognize that as a Burberry guy. You recognize that voice as being Pat Midler's. And the, the direct copy of it is uh, an intentional confusing of the two. So there's all kinds of interesting cases like that. A lot of them have to do with music. Um, and uh, I've had fun enjoy, uh, getting to know this area of law. I encourage you to go down that path as well. This is pretty interesting stuff. So, yes, sir. Irony in this whole thing. One of the supporting cast members that I mentioned that I had my first degree was a very famous designer, and for a few years, I think until very recently, was the president of uh, the Council of Fashion Designers of America. Inadvertently copied <coughs> protected uh, aspects of a jacket design by two Canadian designers. Okay, so Canada has protection. Um, she had to sort of openly uh, disclose because the story was out that she accidentally copied. Meanwhile, she's supporting the law against copy. They ended up settling out of court. Um, I, I know there are other instances uh, like that, but I think, does that get to what you were asking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any others? Yes? It's basically sitting there. Um, you know, I think that. If I were to sort of handicap that situation, um, it's a, and, and I described it earlier as it's a really honed bill, right? It's perfectly fine for a post-election lame duck Congress to sort of pass it along with a bunch of other bills in this frenzy of law building that we tend to see after the election elections. So I think it will pass. That's a good question. Um, what are they? What are the supporters of the of the bill uh, hoping to achieve? Um, we know a little bit about this based on what they say, and they're hoping to achieve fairness. They're hoping to achieve some resolution with this gut reaction that is just basically natural in saying the dark subs of the world are doing something that's not fair, and the Cheney brothers of the world are doing something that's you know they're they're they're. Um, uh, the ones bearing the burden of the unfairness. <laughs> so the proponents are saying this is not fair, which and Congress needs to do something about it. It's actually interesting. They're not saying this is important to promote innovation in the industry, right? Because that would be a hard argument to, uh, you know, to, to, to really carry it. Right? Um, and that if it doesn't pass, it'll be because of the fact that um, it's, uh, the Constitution says to promote innovation, essentially. And here their argument is to promote fairness. Um, what, what they're hoping to, to achieve, other than what they explicitly say, I don't know. But you bring up some plausible uh, scenarios. Attribution, for example. You know, a tribute to Narcissus or Ideas. Well, guess what? That's already happening. It has to happen. Because if the consumer's going to go for it, they have to know that it's a knockoff of, of whatever it is a knockoff of. Right? So the attribution is already there. Um, I, I don't, and, and some of the law professors that I've uh, talked about in the uh, in the talk <coughs> are uh, they, their idea is that um, copying is essential to um, the high end designers doing well because copying comes part and parcel with this attribution. Right? Yes. Uh, do you think that um, a lot of designers 
sort of try to uh, step over that whole idea of the imitators uh, creating their own diffusion. Yes. You know, so that the prophet really rolls really all the way to life. Yeah. Some are successful at that, others are not, and I don't know why. Uh, they seem pretty prevalent examples of this. The Armani line, the Armani exchange line. And I guess there's even a, a, a line above that. Um, bridge lines are successful with some designers, not others. Um, and you know, it could be just a sort of, are you are you good at, at operating this business model? Do you have, are you good at persuading uh, the, uh, the financiers? Um, are you good at, at managing an operation? Um, I really don't have a theory or an explanation for it. But it is the case that some designers have their bridge and their fusion lines. Uh, yeah, you have. That's a way. That's, you know, you can partner up with with uh, with a business model that's already diffused, right? Um, you know, Massimo goes to Target and has a whole line. Now. You can get a Massimo shirt for eight bucks. You know? That's a successful diffusion. Right? Over here first, and then you go. Know. I just had two questions. You mentioned kind of like the pro and con of protecting and fashion. Uh, first question is are you for? My second question is like, do you think that uh, I mean, these designers that want their, I guess, work protected, you know, what, how can they, you know, overcome international barriers, like international law? Uh, see, like something in, you know, Paris being protected in the United States. Yeah, that's a real um, struggle with. Uh, with the performance of this. And, and the reality is that Europe has uh, design protection, protection, Canada does as well. A couple of other places, you know, specifically which ones those are. Um, but essentially, they're on the books, but they're not really, nobody participates in them and they're not really enforced because of this protection. It's a global business, and we don't have global IP law, except for certain uh, areas of that. Yeah, um, that's another question. And I think that one of the good things that has happened through this whole process of having the version of the film is that they place the burden of showing that it's a copy on the design original. Yeah. Well, you know, it, a related thing is like, are design originators purely original? I mean, I know where Carolina Herrera got that hat design, that feather design. She got it from the jerk, the Louis the Jerk. You know, with Richard, uh, sorry, with, uh, Steve Martin, thank you. And he, when he, whenever he makes his millions off of his eyeglass you know, contraption, the first thing he does is he goes out and he buys this brown checkered suit and this big feathered hat, uh, this big um, uh, wool hat with a big old feather. You know, I actually have, well, I have that photograph on my PC. I'll show it and uh, so yeah, I'll put it on the slides. But yeah, it's a related thing. It's like we're talking about shades of degree in all of these questions. Right? I just have a feeling that I can go off That's a that's a very important question. And from the economics point of view, it has to do with um, once the design is is uh, essentially is published, right? Um, how depletable is it if everybody gets the copy, right? How exhausted will it get as a valuable resource if everybody starts to copy? Right? Now with music. Um, you can enjoy the song, I can enjoy the song, others can enjoy the song, and it's fairly durable to um, lots and lots of people enjoy the song. It's not that <laughs> good. You, you, do, you do hear when a song gets overplayed, right? And people get tired of it. Okay, so within a range, uh, I think my choice is, is a good one. It's, it's fairly durable to the future. Um, but I think fashion is even, you know, it, it, it is, is um, one that, that is, is even more durable. 
to, um, to, to copy and to the widespread. Uh, it doesn't get, the, the value of the fashion doesn't get um, suggested by uh, overuse. It gets, you know, the value of the, of the fashion design gets um, to, to decreased by the passage of time. That's the nature of the market. It's so, it's so rapid and sick. Within that, you have these wrap, wrap dresses by von Furstenberg. You have the, the wedding gown by Sicilian. It's an iconic and very value uh, designs. But those are the rare exceptions. And for the most part, we're talking about the chain of Yes, sir. Uh, are there any uh, designers who bank on this facility? Yeah. Okay, so I I don't have the data or the ne necessarily even the anecdotes to back that up what you're saying, but I I think that that is an important part of a lot of high end designers business models. They count on the fact that they're going to be copied. They count on the fact that they're that their copying is going to enhance their reputations as designers. And they also you know um, it's like that scene from The Devil Wears Prada. When the uh, when the uh, Anna Wintour is uh, you know, basically biting the head off of uh, the, 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 the the young intern for saying, "Yeah, I'm going to do this stuff," you know. And what she the, the the way that Anna Wintour you know, bites off the head is to say, "Look, that sweater that you're wearing right now, if you're wearing it, that color is because." And then she starts to reference the innovators uh, who first introduced that color and the, the initial copiers of that color. And then um, the sort of department stores that started to carry more of that color. Right? And so that type of knowledge is, um, you know, it's key to, to people who are in the industry. It's that type because it, it it's key because it enhances and builds their reputations 